I just absolutely love uh, baby dedications and spending time with families of our church. And, and we just have a great church. I, I love our church family here at Pathways, and it's incredible to do life with you. And, and today, I think you're going to agree with my opening statement and my premise, simply this, that we as human beings, we are designed to be in relationship with each other. We are social creatures, true? We're social creatures. In fact, I think we've had a bitter taste of what isolation can do to us over the last couple of years. I think we, we've seen the effects of that with our teenagers and in our own lives and our relationships. It's tough being isolated. That's why God created us for community. In fact, one of the first statements that God made all the way back in Genesis, the very second chapter, he said this to Adam. He said, it is not good for you to be alone. I have made you a helper a helper that is suitable for you. Now, here's the thing about that term helper. In marriage relationships, it doesn't mean that our wives, guys, listen up. It doesn't mean they're some auxiliary or subordinate assistant. They're not less than. In fact, the term helper in the original, in Hebrew, it's used 21 times in the Old Testament. Of the 16 out of the 21 times, it references this divine strength and this rescuing ability. In fact, 16 times it references who God is. It references God himself. He's known as a helper. And men, husbands, listen, lean in. This is very important. I've never met a woman who had a hard time respecting a man who was willing to love her and work hard to love her the way that Jesus Christ teaches us to love our wives. As he loved the church, so we are called to love our wives. Amen? Women, you can clap. You can hoot a little bit. That was, okay, all right. Just saying. <laughs> but it's not just in our marriage relationships that God creates us for community. It's in our families. It's in our neighborhoods. It's in our broader community. I mean, this is seen through all, through all the, the pages and the chapters and the books of the Bible. For example, think about Abraham and Sarah or Moses and Aaron. Think about the, the, the ministry team of, of Elijah. We just studied him, right? A couple, couple of weeks we spent on Elijah and his successor, Elisha. Or what about Joseph? As as dysfunctional as Joseph's family was and as he was sold into slavery and he was in prison and so many trials and tribulations, there was a moment that Joseph couldn't wait to be reunited with his family. Why? Because that's how God has created us, to, to live and to be and have connection. We need that. What about Ruth and Naomi? Or, or what about... What about Joshua? What about the best friends of David and Jonathan or in the New Testament, that ministry couple, that married couple, Priscilla and Aquila, who partnered with the Apostle Paul? We were designed to be in relationship and community. If you zoom out for a moment and you just look at the two Testaments of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Testament, there were 12 tribes. 12 heads of the nation of Israel that comprise these, these tribes that form the people, the nation of Israel. They were in community. Or in the New Testament, we have the church of Jesus Christ that is this faith family that has a mission and a master and a message to take the love and the hope of Jesus Christ to all people for all centuries until Jesus Christ himself returns for his church. We are community. We're designed, we're created, we're embedded in relationships, and that's how we learn and grow together. And I think you would agree with me that, that you've probably experienced it's never good to be cut off. Because when we're in isolation, that's when we can get picked off. That that's when the enemy, your spiritual adversary, Satan himself, can isolate you, and then he can destroy you. I was at uh, the Y the uh, other week and I was passing by one of the elliptical machines and you know how they have the TVs on some of the elliptical machines? I was passing by and I thought to myself, I should be on that elliptical machine, but me and cardio right now, we have a rocky relationship. So I'm like, uh-uh, I ain't jumping on that. You know what I'm talking about. Come on, don't lie. You're acting like you do cardio all the time. Anyways, I'm walking by and I look at it and on the screen, 
I saw this lioness, and this lioness had isolated this animal. I think it's a wildebeest, okay? Kind of isolated this animal, and the wildebeest was kind of looking to get back into the herd, into the pack, get reconnected, and the wildebeest lost his way, and the lioness kind of just hunched down into the, into the bushes. And as I was passing by, I thought to myself, this ain't good. That joker's gone down. And I'm walking by, and all of a sudden, the lioness just leapt and just went right at that wildebeest on this chase, and all of a sudden, just took that animal down. The same is true in our lives. When the enemy can isolate us, imagine if this, if this strand just represented your life, or maybe one of the precious couples on this stage, it represented them. They get cut off from community. The enemy wants to isolate you, and the Bible says that he has wicked schemes in order to destroy our lives. And he does this in isolation. He does this when you're alone. He does this when you are disconnected. My point is simply this. It's the thought and the title of my message. You can't win in isolation. You can't win in isolation. In fact, let's personalize it. I can't win in isolation. Would you say that with me? I can't win in isolation. You just can't win. You can't live your best life when you are isolated. You can't. So let me give you three schemes that the enemy does that he'll throw your way when he has you isolated. The first is this. When you're isolated, the first scheme, if you're taking notes, jot it down. There's no one to help you when you fall. Listen to what scripture says in Ecclesiastes. It says this. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them, what's those two words? Falls down. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and no one is there to help them up. When we're connected, we have the ability to help each other up if we fall. But if we're disconnected and isolated, then the enemy, when he attacks us and we fall, there's no one there to help us. The second scheme is this. Your mind is vulnerable to deceptive thinking. When you get isolated from people, from the body of Christ, from those who care about you, the only thoughts that you have are your own thoughts. And your own thoughts can play tricks on you. The enemy can get in your mind and send patterns, deceptive thoughts, can distort your perception, depression and anger, and, and all these thoughts. And unfortunately, you have nobody there for perspective or wisdom or somebody to support you and your mind, your thought patterns will deceive you. And it's your thoughts that lead to feelings and your feelings and your emotions that drive your behavior and your actions. That's why the enemy, it's the battlefield of the mind and the enemy does a great job when you're isolated. Here's the third scheme. Not only does he mess with your mind, but he he weakens our church here at Pathways. Listen, friends, when the enemy can isolate you as an individual, he can weaken who we are as the body of Christ. You ask why? Well, because every single one of us, we have a role to play here at our church. This isn't just about pastors. It's not about elders. It's about every one of us participating. God designed his church that he would serve as the head and that we, we would receive wisdom and joy through the local church. But even for us to ever experience this kind of joy and wisdom from a local church, we must be involved. We need to be engaged. There is not a single person watching online, whatever state you are, or if you're here in this room, or perhaps you missed this, this weekend, you'll watch this post. You are not dispensable when it comes to who Jesus Christ is and who he has called us to be at Pathways Church. I don't know if you know this, friends, but God is imprinting his DNA on Pathways Church. This church is unlike any other church. We can celebrate that. But every other church is unlike 
any other church. Why? Because God is into doing new things and he takes every local church body and he represents his heart to the world through that specific community of believers. And that community is comprised of individuals just like you and me. There is no one that is dispensable when it comes to the work and the movement of who God is and what he wants to bring to our community. None of us are. He needs every single person to be engaged. Now, last week, we talked about spending time alone with the Lord, right? We talked about how this was Jesus' practice, and that developed Jesus as our model in terms of loving all people. He loved them uh, genuinely and authentically. He was so inviting and so generous and, and so loving and kind to individuals. Kind of sets the standard. But here's what you need to know about Jesus Christ. While Jesus gave dignity to all people, he sure did. Did he give value to every single person? Yep. Did he honor everyone? Yes, he did. Did he love the masses? Yep. Every single person. Remember I told you who he locked eyes with, the love of the Father poured through his face. He sure did. Did he spend equal time and give face time equally to all people? No, he did not. See, Jesus understood the power of community. He understood that we were created not just for the masses or for large numbers, but we needed a circle of individuals that we shared life with at a deeper level. Not just our family of origin, but other brothers and sisters in the faith. That's why I love the New Testament, because when Paul addresses in the epistles, he always says brothers and sisters. There's this connection that they know each other in these small pockets of house churches. They're deeply acquainted. They didn't have big auditoriums like this. They didn't have online capability. They had house churches where they were gathering in groups of people and they were breaking bread together and sharing with one another. And Jesus modeled this to us first. He called 12, we would know them to be the apostles, 12 disciples. In fact, you know what Jesus did when he launched his ministry? He went and he spent, you can read it for yourself in the gospels. He spent an entire evening with the Lord. He prayed all night and he said, God, now who are the 12 people that, that you want to support me with and that I want to invest my life into? It's pretty amazing. And then this is what it says. I'm going to give you the list of their names. It's found in, in Matthew chapter 10. This is what Jesus, he called his 12 disciples to himself. First of all, our first call is always to God himself, to be in relationship, spend time with him. And then he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. Jesus is a small group, if you will. Simon, who is called Peter and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. We all know him because he betrayed Jesus. And he took these 12 individuals, and there was a deep connection and bond with them. I mean, if you think about it, if Jesus needed to be in close proximity and connection and to share his life with individuals and likewise to receive the, the encouragement and the support of other individuals, how much more important is this for you and for me? So what I want to do in the time that remains is I want to give you uh, five benefits of what any group of Christ followers whether you're serving together or whether you're in a relational kind of small group together, some of the benefits as we find them in Jesus's life, this spans time and century, space and geographical location so that we can be created and connected and in relationship in Christian community. The first benefit is this. First benefit is that you're gonna handle stress better. I don't know if you know this, but you were, you were never designed to, to handle stress alone. And this goes against our North American mindset, doesn't it? I mean, we even have sayings. If you want a job done, then do it your, yep, do it yourself. That works for a while. And don't we value a strong work ethic, especially being in the Midwest? Hey, we're going to wake up earlier, work harder, last longer. We're going to do it ourselves. We don't need help from anybody. That's a great principle to start out with. But if you if you subscribe to that over the long haul, you're gonna burn out. 
you're going to burn out because we need each other. And when the pressure mounts in our lives, you need a group of people. One of the benefits of being in a small group and hanging with people is that you can share some of that stress. You can say, hey, I'm stressed. It's difficult. I'm having a hard time. And Jesus was very clear to us as his disciples. He said this later on in Matthew chapter 10 to those original ones, the 12. He said in verse 22, he said, you're going to be hated by everyone because of me. There will be times when you're following Jesus and you need to know that you're going to be persecuted. There are times if you're a student, when you take a stand, you're going to be made fun of. When you're an adult and you back away from something that's sinful or you you do something that is God honoring, people are going to look at you. People might persecute you. This is what Jesus told us. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. How do we stand firm to the end? It's a lot easier to stand firm when we stand with other people who are believers and have the same moral compass and biblical values that we share. The second benefit is, is simply this. You have a circle of people to celebrate life with. Think about Jesus for a moment. How many boat rides on the Sea of Galilee did he have with his 12 disciples? Think about how many times they went fishing. Think about when they would hike mountains and all the stories that we don't have contained in the Gospels. Gospel of John, I think it's chapter 20, says there's so much that we don't even, a whole library, you couldn't fill the world with all the stories that Jesus was in relationship with his disciples. And can you imagine Can you imagine what it was like when perhaps you took a nap and everybody was napping and you woke up and man, there there was Jesus. Hey, let's go do this. Let's go hang out. I'm sure they laughed together. They cried together. They had stories and inside jokes. I mean, they were were close. Think about the time that they were uh, experienced the miracle that we would know as the feeding of 5,000. Real time, they had no idea. In fact, Philip was like, Jesus, can you wrap this up? We've got to get this message done. People got to get back to their houses. They need to eat. It's getting like dinner time, right? What's for supper? What are we doing, Jesus? And Jesus is like, well, let's go feed them. Let's feed them. And uh, Philip's like, are you crazy? It would take, do you remember how many months wages? Eight months wages to feed these people. And then Andrew's like, hey, we have this little boy. Can you imagine after that miracle when Philip and Andrew and Peter were walking back? Scripture says that each of them had a basket full of food. Can you imagine Philip was saying to Peter, Peter, did you see what he did? Did you see what Jesus, that was insane. And Peter's like, yeah, I saw what he did. And first of all, I saw you get sassy with Jesus. Usually that's me going to say something stupid like that. But that was you, bro. And then he made you look like a fool. I'm not a fool. Jesus loves me. I know he does. But still, I mean, you look dumb. Because then my brother Andrew had that little boy with the lunch. And Jesus started breaking it apart. And he fed 5,000 men. And then all those women and children, there were probably like 20,000 people, Philip. And Philip would be like, I know. That was amazing. And then Andrew was like, guys, come on, let's just go home. I'm tired. And they were all walking back with their basket of bread and fish. You ever wonder why Jesus did that? Because I think he wanted those 12 individuals to know that when we're in relationship with one another, there's always abundance and provision beyond ourselves. We share life together. Um, You know, one of the things that I love about our church is that we get to share life with one another, not just in groups, but we set up whole systems to do that. We have uh, money set aside for benevolence. We do things as a church to support the faith family when we go in hard times. We do this in small groups. We do this in serving teams. There's so much love and generosity being poured out because we're just connected and we celebrate life together. When our youngest daughter, Ella, recently this past uh, last couple of months committed to the University of Michigan, uh, after we call all her family, do you know who I called? I called Daryl Davis. I said, Daryl, she accepted an offer to Michigan. Gang, we squealed like middle school girls on the the phone together. I was like, yeah, that was awesome. And Daryl's like, I can't believe it. 
And then our friends, Kendall and Canaan, who no longer are part of our body here in Appleton, but live in Missouri. Sometimes they'll tune in from Joplin. Do you know they got Laura and, and me? They got us gifts. Uh, Laura got a little coffee mug in Michigan. I got a little golf divot finder thing, replacer with Michigan on it. See, Canaan and Kendall, their own chocolate, they've been a part of our lives for years and we celebrate life together when something good happens in their lives. We are connected. We're connected. Who are you connected to? Who can you celebrate life with? If it's just as empty as posting something on Facebook or Instagram or tweeting something to gain followers and likes and you miss life with people, you miss life, you truly are not living the life that Jesus modeled and called us to live, to live life to the full, to live it abundantly. And we need people to do this with. Not only do we need to celebrate life together, but in groups of people, we can serve together. I mean, I love seeing our church serve. When we serve, when, when pockets of people serve and Pathways Kids or when they do water wars or when we feed people, when we give like 100,000 meals and we do Project Feed More, we support our partners and teams of people are serving across generations. It's incredible. I mean, think about John chapter six. Think about the, 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 the miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. This is what scripture says in verse 11. After Jesus gave thanks, he took the loaves and he distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted and he did the same with the fish. Question, how did he distribute the loaves and the fish? He used the disciples he used the small group of people that he did life with. The celebration of having that bread basket came after the serving opportunity, the miracle that they participated in. And just like what Jesus did in John chapter six, he does today. We are a part of the miracle of providing and doing good things for brothers and sisters in our community, in our neighborhood, in our state, in our nation, and around the world. We get to be a part of that miracle together. As I've told you in the past, the church is not like a football game. It's not 70,000 people who are in desperate need of exercise watching 22 players who are in need of rest. It's every single one of us who are on the playing field of ministry and using our gifts and our passions and our abilities to make a kingdom difference. That's like a benefit. It's a benefit. Well, not only to serve together and to celebrate life and to handle stress better, but benefit number four is this. Uh, you have people in your life to lean on when you're spiritually weak. This is what Jesus participated in on the very last night of his life. Matthew 26 says this. He said, um, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Peter, James, and John, would you pray here as I go over and I pray? Remember the prayer he prayed? God, if it's possible, take this cup from me. And eventually he surrendered and he said, not my will, but your will would be done. He didn't need his disciples to give him words of encouragement. He didn't need, he didn't need what he needed was their presence. He needed their presence. You know, we have a ministry here at our church called Stephen Ministry, and it's all about presence. If you need somebody just to sit with you and be present with you, in whatever area and stage of life, then you need to reach out to somebody. We have people who are waiting to be present with you. The fifth benefit is this. You gain wisdom and perspective when you're with a circle of people. Proverbs 1.5 says this, let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. You know, I don't know too many people who say, you know what, I don't want to learn. I don't want to grow. I don't want to get better as a human being. I just kind of want to stay stuck. Not a lot of people will say that. However, a lot of people aren't finding wisdom and perspective when they sit with other godly individuals because their life doesn't reflect that priority of time and of commitment and of relationship. And this is a benefit. See, because when you only see things your way, you get tunnel vision, you get locked. 
But when you add people who have the wisdom of God's word and life experience and a different set of experiences, they can give you perspective, which can help you in terms of the challenge or the struggle or the grief or the victory or whatever it is or the situation that you're currently facing. The last benefit is simply this. You can bounce back from failure faster. This is pretty cool. And you think about the disciples. You think about after Jesus prayed and as he was going to go to the cross, he had a little moment with the apostle Peter. And he said to Peter, he said, you know, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, no way. I'll never do that. I'll never do that, Jesus. On that very evening, betrayed Jesus three times to a little servant girl around the fire. Then Jesus was nailed to the cross and it was one of the most torturous and gruesome deaths. Unimaginable that a completely innocent, fully human, fully divine individual would pay that kind of sacrifice for our sins. And can you imagine being Peter? You're the one who denied him. Can you imagine hearing the rooster in the morning thinking, oh my word, I failed miserably. Ever fail miserably? Ever know that feeling of like, man, God, you've given me so much. You've blessed me so much. And I have failed so deeply. You know where Peter went when he failed? He went to a small group. He went to that small group of disciples who were grieving the death of their Messiah, he went to them and he said, not only am I so sad because Jesus was nailed to the cross, but guys, he told me that I was going, he told me I was going to deny him and I was so proud and I, I thought I was so committed and yet I denied him. Not once, not twice, three times. And long before the resurrected Savior came to Peter in John chapter 21 and had a meal with him around the Sea of Galilee, long before that took place, Peter received the kind of care and the grace from that group of people, his small group, before he heard the words of Jesus in his own life. Because they probably had encouraged him and said, you know, Peter, I know you failed him, but don't you remember when Jesus said to you that upon you, Peter, I'm gonna build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Peter, don't you remember? You were the only one of us that actually walked on water. Peter, I get it. You messed up big, but I just think that that our Messiah loves you deeply. He loves you continuously. He loves you without fault. And Peter's like, yeah, but there's no way he could use me again. Have you ever felt that way? There's no way he could use me because of that huge failure, because of my past, because of my pride or my stubbornness or my arrogance. I blew it again. I always blow it. And I just want you to know today that it takes a pocket of people to bounce back from failure, to encourage and support. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 10 that we spur one another on to good deeds, but not only good deeds, to receive good grace in our lives. So today, the application of the message is really easy. We've been illustrating it since baby dedication. Illustration is simply this. Are you connected? Are you connected? Are, are you connected? Are you connected in such a way that connected to a couple people who know and love you? Are you connected to a serving team? Is this just a place that you attend? Or is this your church that relationally you're invested in at a level that is like, man, this is, this moves me. Here's my, this is my church family. This is an empty ritual. This isn't just some religious obligatory thing that I do to check a box. No, these people I care about, I pray for. I do Romans 12, 15. When they when they cry and mourn, I mourn and I cry. When they, 
are so excited, I rejoice with them. I serve with them. I break bread with them. I dedicate babies with them. I grieve with them. And someone dies. When we have a serving gap, I serve. It's the kind of people more than ever, friends, more than ever, we need to be a kind of church that is connected deeply and wholly like that. When we golf together, we go on retreat together, when we have fun together, when we laugh together, more than ever, our world is looking for a church that is connected. Years ago, I used to say that Pathway is the biggest, smallest church you'll ever experience. And I'm proud of that. God, God didn't ever want to just build crowds and masses of people. He wanted to build human beings in relationship with one another that they might represent this belonging and being known and connected. And we do that in circles. We do that when we serve. Is it messy? Is it hard? Yeah, it is. But so is your family and so are your relationships. But I'd much rather do it with Jesus Christ at the center than Jesus outside of the circle, amen? I want to do it where God is looking down and saying, yes, this is my plan, this is my hope, that Jesus would be lifted up by a group of people right here where we live. For this time, this season, God is imprinting his DNA on our church, and I just got to believe that comes through powerful relationships of circles of people who are committed to God and to one another. You know how much I love when I see you in the community? You know how much I love when you text me and when I can text you and call you and randomly connect? But I have the joy of being the pastor. Some of you, you, you need to find those relationships. And you need to do that because you're not on stage or you don't know every single person. I don't know every single person, but I try to. And, and you do that when you begin to serve together. So the application is real simple. Are you serving? Are you in a serving role? If you're not, you need to talk to somebody at Connect. You need to download our app. You need to get engaged. Somebody texted me this week and said, I'm ready. I want to start serving on Sundays. Unprompted, unsolicited. He's going to be better for that. Our church will be better. The kingdom will move forward. Are you serving? There's so many roles and opportunities for you to get engaged. In October, we're gonna launch a four-week message-based small groups where I make questions up about the message and then you sit with other people. There are groups that we're taking new territory, Wednesday nights, midweek offerings for parents as your kids are in Roots or in Pathway students. We want you to get connected. We're so committed to this. We devote time, energy, dollars to personnel and people and staff so that we can function as the body of Christ as outlined in Acts chapter two. We're just not coming to a row. We're not just spending time with God alone, but we're in community together. And those relationships are what endures and keeps us through thick and thin. And so that's my call to you today. If you need help, talk to a staff. Reach out to us on social media. You're online. You're a part of the body of Christ. Don't be isolated. You can do things online. You can stay connected. We can pray, we can get in group together. You can serve wherever you are to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Now, as I close in a word of prayer, if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me, I wanna to speak to two different groups of individuals. First of all, I wanna to speak to believers. Perhaps today, the Lord is just stirring your heart for a deeper relationship, getting connected a little deeper here at Pathways. You kind of come on the weekend, you see it, and you're like, yeah, okay, this is, this is a good church, I like it. But it's not your church. You're still kind of spectating. You're like one of the 70,000 in the stand and God is saying, hey, 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 come and be a part of the 22 on the field. There's so much more joy. You maximize so much more of the Christian walk when you walk with people in relationship and serving together. And you know God is speaking to you today that's you today, then I just want to pray for you in this moment. Heavenly Father, you speak to people online across these rows, and if you are calling to deeper engagement and commitment, God, through serving and stepping into relationship, God, I pray, Lord, that you would lead my brothers and sisters to do that, that they would be obedient to your voice and your prompting. 
And God, I thank you for all of the individuals who are committed, who are core here at Pathways, Lord, that you would continue to give them favor and blessing. Thank you for their lives, how they're serving and caring for each other, Lord. What a blessing. Now, if you're here today and you need to bounce back in life, because the biggest bounce you can have is bouncing back from a life of death and sin. And you know your life is going down a path and it's a path of pain and you need Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin. You, you've tried to control it and own it and manage it and power up on it. And now you just need to surrender. You need to surrender. You need to say, uh, Jesus, I'm tired of trying to drive my life. It might look good from the outside, but inside I'm decaying. I have, I'm, I'm soulless, I'm just on autopilot and I need you to drive because I, I need forgiveness, I need adventure. I want to live my best life. I can't win in isolation and I definitely can't win apart from you. So today, if you wanna make a decision for Jesus Christ, if you're online today, just type in, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Do it now, talk to somebody, DM somebody, text somebody, let somebody know. If you're in the room today and you wanna make a decision for Jesus Christ, if you would just raise your hand in this moment, I wanna acknowledge you. Yes, I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand. Anybody else? Yes, I see your hand right down front. All the way in the back, I see your hand. Okay, then let's pray this prayer together out loud. As one church, we're connected. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. From the beginning of time, you knew me. My days were numbered before one of them came to pass. And you knew about today that I would let my pride fall and let my sin go. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I repent. I was wrong. Come into my life. I receive you, Jesus, as my Savior and Lord. The free gift of salvation that I can't earn that I can't work for, but I can receive. So I receive you. I love you. In Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed with this prayer said, amen. Hey, let's celebrate today. Individuals, children and students giving their lives to Jesus Christ. That's exciting. It's exciting, exciting, exciting.